everybody. Today we're going to finish up with chapter 8, which deals with, again, managing change. Yesterday we saw uh, the movie Who Moved My Cheese, and it kind of give you an idea of how important it is not to hem and haw uh, or take their example. But today we're going to take a look at some more strategies uh, to make sure that your change process uh, goes about as uh, positively as it can. Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and resume Chapter 8 as we finish up today, uh, this chapter. Yesterday, we showed you a video called Moving, Who Moved My Cheese? And it showed you the perils of just trying to stay in one place and not branching out and trying new things uh, or changing, period, with him and Hall. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at some more strategies for uh, change management and hopefully you can incorporate these into your management and leadership strategy. Now first of all we are going to talk about constructing the envisioned future. Now Tuesday we looked at preparing the organization for change and we saw where communication uh, and uh, uh, getting the proper resources in place and all of that was important but now we're constructing the future. Uh, we're creating that vision and when we do that, we want to ask ourselves a couple of questions. First of all, what are the bold and valued outcomes? And this deals with the performance and human outcomes that the organization would like to achieve. Also, it needs to be clear, tangible targets for organization actions. So uh, this is what we expect uh, the human resource end of the organization to be able to achieve uh, as the outcome of this change initiative. Also, what is the desired future state? And here you give that detail of what the organization should look like when outcomes have been achieved. If you remember Tuesday, I told you that uh, uh, where you are and where you want to be is the really the first consideration and the gap between where you are and where you want to be is the problem. And to fix the problem, you need to change. You need to move from where you are to the desired state. And in order to do that, you have to incorporate change management strategies. Uh, this is really what I just talked about. You have the current state, you have the desired future state, and the transition state. This is the key here. You're going to have to resolve this transition before you can get to the desired state. And that's where the communication, pr uh, preparing the people for change, all of these factors come into play. So this is where you are, this is where you want to be, and this is what it's going to take to get there. So very simple, straightforward formula, but it is a very important formula to understand and to uh, uh, to include in your change strategy. Now, if you remember when I talked to you Tuesday, I told you the two components for uh, moving, changing, uh, making your goals happen. You had to have uh, attainment, which is the uh, resource that are resources that you're going to need to uh, uh, practically make that change happen. But along the same spectrum, you also have uh, alignment. And this is where you develop political support. These are the factors that you have to look at. Assess the change agent power. Now here's what uh, I had to face in the uh, majority of change initiatives that I uh, was asked to, to bring about. Most of the organizations wanted change. They were on board with my strategies, but when it came to them actually having to do something, I lost support. And as a result, the change uh, didn't take place. And of course, they perished. So how much power the change agent, agent is given uh, is gonna be a key factor. Now, it's important to understand when it comes to change agents, there are internal change agents and there are external change agents. 
Of course, the change agent that is internal is someone from within your organization. They've been asked to uh, bring about change or to develop a new process or structure or whatever. Uh, the benefits to using a internal change agent is that they know the organization, they're familiar with it, they know the culture and the values and uh, the traditions and beliefs and so forth, so they will have an easier time uh, relating to and navigating through all the people, the culture of the organization. Uh, the problem with change agents from an internal standpoint is that their strengths are really their weaknesses. There's nothing innovative coming out of them because they are so ingrained in the company that they really follow along still the same company model because they're not familiar with anything different. So an external change agent is someone from the outside coming in. They can put a fresh set of eyes, and that's what I was. I was an external change agent. They can put a fresh set of eyes on what needs to take place in that organization and as such, you get more objectivity, you get more innovation and creativity out of them, but the downside is that they don't understand all of these little nuances and values and beliefs and so forth. And if you remember when I drew that iceberg, they oftentimes hit head on and they sink. So the best way of getting uh, change to occur is incorporating both internal and external and having them work together and that makes for a more well-rounded approach to whatever change is going to be necessary. But the other end of the problem or challenge is that unless the change agent really has the power to affect change, they're spinning their wheels. Uh, and I've seen it time and time again. Uh, companies will pat you on the back and they will support you up until the point where you have to start rearranging uh, their plans and strategies and it may go against their, and I'm talking about the executives or the CEO, their philosophies and so forth. So all of these things need to be communicated right from the very beginning uh, because if they're not, uh, you're going to have difficulties. Now the second is to identify key stakeholders. Uh, the key stakeholders, as I said earlier, are the ones that you want to align with early. Key stakeholders could be uh, in ministry, it could be the ministers, it could be the deacons, it could be sister so-and-so who has been there for 50 years and everybody comes to her for advice. Uh, that would be a key stakeholder. A key stakeholder in business would be the ones who are gonna be necessary to gather support and also resources. So you want to identify them and once you've identified them, you want to influence them. And if you remember, part of that uh, strategy for influencing is to show empathy and support for them. Hey, uh, realize this may be something new and uncomfortable, but this is what is going on, this is what's needed, and this is why we need it and then communicate in a positive way the outcomes and focus on the outcomes. And once you have their support, then you have a whole lot of the game uh, won uh, at that point. Then let them go and do the work. Let them go instead of you being the one to influence. Let these influencers go out and influence the rest of the people because they're going to listen to them before they'll listen to you anyway. So assess the change agent power, identify key stakeholders, and then influence the key stakeholders. Now, in leadership, we talk about sources of power and power strategies. Uh, it goes without saying that this has to take place for change agents as well. And your textbook talks about knowledge, uh, and that's just being straightforward uh, with the people. Uh, you tell them, okay, in six months this company's going under, and this is why. So use your knowledge to influence people. Uh, other support, and that's using social networks to uh, go and align or get more alignment within the organization. And then personality, and that's going around the formal system. You may be able to persuade and to 
use your um, uh, influence of personality and uh, and so forth to be able to uh, break down barriers, uh, to bypass maybe barriers that have existed and um, be able to go ahead and get that change uh, uh, onward and going. Now managing the transition, okay, we have uh, our stakeholders in place, they're out influencing, but what's next? You know, what plan do you have for this uh, department or organization or ministry or whatever? Well, here's the roadmap, and this is what you need to provide. If we do this, this is how we're going to get there. So activity planning is gathering together the attainment part of it. Uh, we need to do this, 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 and this uh, at these intervals or during these time frames. And then once that's happened, uh, we will have the, uh, uh, the initiative or the plan uh, in action. Uh, commitment planning, whose support is needed, where do they stand and how to influence them. Uh, so here we see that uh, getting people to align once more, getting a commitment out of them is going to be necessary. Now change management structures. What's the appropriate arrangement of people in power to drive the change? Uh, and as I told you earlier, You've got this cone, and as you're getting the alignment down here, uh, you're creating that energy that's going to propel and drive that change. The more people you get, the more resources you're going to be able to garner. And uh, again, as you're going up and down, you're going to be able to garner more support. Learning processes. What knowledge and skills does the organization need to support uh, the new behaviors. Now here's what is important uh, to know in, in this section or when you get to this point. If you don't reinforce the new behaviors, they're going to go back to the way that they were doing. This is called extinction. This happens in psychology with uh, uh, behavioral theorists. Uh, if you condition or if you train a person to exhibit new behaviors, uh, we are creatures of habit. If it's not constantly supported until it becomes an ingrained uh, uh, part of just natural behavior once more, they're going to go back to the old behavior. So what does the organization need uh, to support these new behaviors and knowledge and skills and so forth? Now also too, uh, when we're talking about supporting new behaviors, it's not just a matter of after the fact. During this attainment part here, you're going to need knowledge and skills so that you can attain uh, the end goal. So you've got knowledge, skills, support that's going to be necessary throughout the change and also once the change has occurred you need to reinforce those behaviors. So that's probably going to be here in another slide as well but it's enough to know at this point that uh, the organization is going to have to create a platform for change and also a support network for change once it's occurred. Uh, accelerating the learning processes during change. Um, you can create a systems view of the organization and a systems view of the organization uh, this is a word that we use today in strategic management and that essentially means that no organization operates in a vacuum in the past the traditional structure was to have let's say the CEO uh, the vice president and then from the vice president, you had other vice presidents of each uh, department. And under them, you had managers um, uh, within each department. And I'm just doing this quickly. But uh, each department, and then you had the departments here. Uh, now, what I mean by department, you may have HR. Uh, you may have research and development, you may have ops, you may have accounting or admin or whatever. Each department 
is distinct. They fall under distinct leadership. Now, this tends to create isolation within the organization. It is the traditional way of management uh, because if I want to know something about HR, if I'm the CEO, I don't need to go to different departments. I just need to go to the HR department. If I want to know about finance, I'll go to the finance department. And each department is going to give me the most accurate and up-to-date information in their realm for that organization. And even though it can be uh, efficient and uh, effective in that respect, if I'm working in isolation and I'm not talking to uh, research and development, and research and development is not talking to um, uh, operations and operations is not talking to accounting and so on and so forth, then you have divisions. And those divisions can create conflict. One uh, of the uh, organizations that I went into to try to help was a college. It was a Christian college, but they were the most divisive, combative, confrontational individuals I've ever seen in any organization. Even the secular organizations were not as bad as these individuals. It, and it's because they all worked uh, individually. Each department thought that they were the most important department in that whole school. I mean, HR thought that um, uh, if it wasn't for HR, the school wouldn't exist. Uh, finance believed that if finance didn't uh, do what they did, the, the company wouldn't exist uh, or the school wouldn't exist. Um, and individually, they're right, but there was no one department over the other. So there was fighting, there was divisiveness, there was a lot of territorialism going on, and uh, eventually the, uh, the, comp or the, the school uh, collapsed. Now a systems approach sees everything here as one unit, as one organization. What you do in HR is going to influence uh, R&D and it's going to influence ops and accounting and what accounting does is going to influence these guys and these guys and these guys and these guys are going to influence this one and so on and so forth ad nauseum. When you start to think from a systems approach, what you're doing is stepping away from the trees to look at the forest and you see things differently. You see those interrelationships. You see those uh, interdependencies that have to take place within that organization for that organization to function. You no longer see an organization as consisting of uh, operations and uh, administration and uh, finance or marketing or whatever. You see all of them intertwined as one uh, functioning and hopefully productive unit. And that's something that is, uh, even though it's necessary, many people have difficulty seeing it that way. Now when you take strategic management, we'll get into a little bit more about systems, but you need to communicate if change is going to take place that no one department is important uh, over, the, over another that they're all interdependent. And when something happens in one area, it's going to affect the whole organization some way. So that's a systems approach, and they need to understand that. Create shared meaning with models, language, tools, so that the members have a common way of viewing the change, uh, speak in the way that they can understand, engage in after action reviews once you have reached milestones, and as you reach milestones, Look at the after action. What did we do to get here? What were the lessons learned and so forth? Uh, decentralize implementation processes and decisions to the lowest level possibles, uh, possible. Now this is important because the more people who are involved in this change and the more decision making that you give them, the more buy-in that you're going to have. It's only going to go good for you and the change process as more people get into it. Uh, if the boss says, okay, we're going to change this next week and everybody get on board, uh, you may have difficulties. Now, they may change, but they may not be uh, so happy or they may not give you the support that you need or they may not have the buy-in that you need for that uh, change initiative to last. So decentralize it. That means take it out of one or two hands and distribute um, 
decision making throughout the organization. Sustaining momentum, uh, you resource for change, again, that's the attainment side of it. Build a support system for change agents, that's the alignment. Develop new competencies and skills, and that's difficult sometimes because uh, for some people they're afraid of learning new things uh, and developing new skills, and uh, you need to be aware of that and sympathetic to that, but you still must insist that uh, the new uh, behaviors are going to be necessary to uh, make this change happen and then reinforce new behaviors. And as I said before, if you don't do that, extinction will occur and they'll revert back to the old behaviors. It's happened time and time again. I've seen it in ministry uh, with people I've counseled and I've seen it happen in churches and I've seen it happen in businesses. So reinforce those behaviors. And then finally, stay the course and that's sustaining momentum. Uh, change requires time and uh, anticipate that financial and organizational benefits may lag behind implementation. Uh, one of the things that uh, I believe is the reason for many companies not to change is that while you're changing, you're going to lose money. People are learning new things, they're learning new ways, so you're not going to be able to operate optimally uh, for the duration of that change and even after as they try to incorporate those new behaviors into the organization. But once the change is finished and the people know what they're doing and they're fully qualified and motivated, that's when you're going to start seeing the returns. The problem that many people have today is that they are fixed on short-term or short-term short returns. I'll get it right in a minute. They're wanting to see immediate uh, dividends for their investment. But that doesn't happen when you're looking at change management. It takes time. So anticipate that. Uh, organization members need time to practice, develop, and learn new behaviors. And again, that's that learning curve. And then successful change requires persistent leadership during transitions. Now, a lot of times organizations will start out of the gate strong, like I've experienced personally and they see that uh, the change is going to be too uncomfortable or there may be other reasons that um, they may uh, change their mind or they may just uh, lose steam. If you remember, the two elements, attainment and alignment, have to keep going uh, in order to build up that momentum. If not, then it's going to collapse. So be persistent. Keep on going. Uh, keep developing resources, keep motivating the people, and that's going to increase the likelihood that your change initiative will be successful. One, we took a look here at some of the other processes about change that you need to be aware of, especially how to transition from that current state to the desired state. We saw some of the uh, reasons why we need to be able to maintain both alignment and attainment. And we took a look also at some other processes that can help us in our strategy in making sure that change will take place uh, effectively. Well, that's all we have for today. Uh, we'll be back next week with Chapter 9. Until then, God bless you, and we'll see you then.